Last week on Technique Tuesday, we measured weight. This week, we are measuring volume. Now, I'm a weight person about 80%. Volumetric measurements have their place. The advantage to measuring volume rather than measuring weight is that it's quick. It's at least quick when you're doing the same thing over and over again. If you've ever worked a fry station in a restaurant, usually you have a little scoop that goes into a sheath. That's a volumetric measurement. A lot of times on like a deli line, you'll see scoops into the food that they'll scoop out and they'll just put the one scoop on their plate. That's a volumetric measurement. It's all meant to save time. The problem with volumetric measurements is that they are wildly inaccurate, at least the way that solids go. And the reason I don't like them for solids is that solids, unless it's one brick the size of your measuring cup, it's going to have some air in there. And that's fine. It doesn't mean we're getting cheated. It just means that you're not getting the same measurement every time. And that's going to be really small with something like a tablespoon and a little larger with something like a cup. By the way, for the purposes of these videos, we should clarify that I'm using the American standard version of measuring cups and measuring spoon. I don't know if it has a cleaner name. And that's not to separate it from metric, that's to separate it from the imperial standard, which is much higher. Let's just take the cup. The cup roughly is 240 milliliters, as opposed to the imperial cup, which is much closer to 300 milliliters. For the people who are not native to metric, that's a difference of about two ounces. And by the way, I'm not native to metric either. I just use it because the units are the same from zero to infinity. The continuity of the units alone is enough to drive me towards the metric system. With this Cambro, this will hold 12 quarts plus some or 12 liters. The difference is that I have to know that this makes up three gallons and that if I'm going to fill this to the top, it's going to be a third of a firkin plus a pottle. If I fill it to this top on this side, I know that that's 12 and a half liters. And if I have 10 of these, it's going to be the same unit of measurement. It's going to be 125 liters. You could say that it's a hectoliter plus 25, but I don't think anybody does that. This drop of water here is a standardized unit of measurement. It's called a minim. Standardized in that it's measurable in water because different liquids have different viscosities and therefore different drop sizes. This is also a standardized unit of measurement. The water in there, that amount of water is called a dram. When Romeo was asking the apothecary for a dram of poison, he just meant a little bit. A dram is 60 drops. A dram is also three quarters of a teaspoon because a teaspoon is 80 drops. Now this is where we get into the standard of today. This teaspoon, which is standardized in the US, is 5 milliliters, and this tablespoon, which is standardized in the US, is 15 milliliters. A tablespoon equals three teaspoons, so if you ever get down to the third of a tablespoon, they're talking about a teaspoon. I also mix these up all the time. They both start with T. It's another thing I don't like about volumetric measurements. The next one up, which I forgot, is an ounce, which is different than a weight, a weighted ounce. If you think that's confusing, just wait till I get going. The quarter cup was originally named a jack or half a jill, and the half cup, you guessed it, was a jill. Double that is a cup. A cup is just a cup, although it's not really a cup, and double that is a pint. Double that is a quart, and then we get into the names we don't really use anymore. Two quarts equals half a gallon, or a pottle. Two pottles is a gallon, and then it gets really tricky. Now from here it gets hairy because there are different units of volumetric measurements for dry goods, for beer, and for wine. There are others, but these three seem to be the most common. I'm going to use beer, but there is a little bit of crossover with wine, which is not always the same. Four and a half gallons is a pin. Double that, nine gallons, is a firkin. Or if you've ever bought a pony keg, you've drank a firkin before. 
double that and 18 gallons, that's a kilderkin or the modern keg of beer. And double that is a barrel. If you've ever heard the term half barrel for a keg of beer, that's where it comes from. Next measurement up from there only goes up one and a half times, not two times, and that's a hogshead, which is 54 gallons. Next we have a pipe or a butt, which is two hogsheads or three barrels or 108 gallons. And then we get back into doubling with a ton, that's T-U-N, which is two pipes or 216 gallons. There are also liquid and dry measuring cups to consider. In each of these vessels, I have an ounce of water. These both have their drawbacks. The one that was designed for solids, I have a very high uh, probability to spill that because they're designed to be filled to the top and to be scraped off. So if you want a true measurement of your liquid, you're gonna need to fill that to the top run the risk of making a mess. And if you go with a liquid measuring cup, your chances of overfilling are pretty decent. I do tend to favor these though, instead of dry measuring cups for liquid, because I can build a sauce in here. You remember me saying the cup is not really a cup? If you take old recipes and try to make them today, usually a cup meant five or five and a half ounces, whereas this is eight. Furthermore, cup can mean cup or cup or cup none of which are standardized units of measurement the thing that drives me nuts the most though is coffee a lot of directions a lot of written directions for home coffee makers will tell you how much coffee to add to their machine to make a cup but they're not talking about a volumetric cup, they're talking about a cup of coffee, which is subjective to everyone. How big do you want your cup of coffee? I have not done extensive research on every coffee maker on the planet, but I can tell you the four or five that I have read have not given me standardized units to work with, which is absolutely maddening. My nemesis. This is why I switched to a scale. You're gonna make me do this, and I'm gonna do this for you, because I love you. This is a flour sifter. This is not mine. This moved in with my girlfriend. It has a measure on the side, but it's absolutely crap, because there's a sieve in here that gets in the way of the measure. And I don't know why there's a measure on the flour sifter because the point of putting flour through the flour sifter is to get an accurate measurement. You can also use a mesh strainer, just something to get air inside of the flour. You can tell I'm delaying the inevitable, can't you? The biggest complaint that I hear about using a scale is that while you're doing the same amount of dishes anyway, you need a spoon to get it out of the bag. What if you over pour, then you have to put some back in. Look at all these dishes that I'm using to do this properly. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Now we have our sifted flour, but we can't just go scooping it up. We'll compact it again. Scoop our flour into our cup to get an accurate cup. We're going to scoop it up and lay it in and then we have our rounded cup. So what do we do next? Now we need something with a flat surface. A quarter cup should be 30 grams. So 30 times 4, that's 120 grams. Let's see if we're close. And we're right on the money. So let's compare that to just scooping out some flour. And even if we level it, even if we take our knife and level this flour, hundred and sixty grams. That's the equivalent of a quarter cup more. And over 
the course of multiple cups, let's say that something you're doing something big and it calls for six cups of flour. Well, just through not using your measuring cup correctly, you've just added an extra cup and a half and there's no way that you've added enough liquid to let that flour hydrate correctly. It's going to be dry. Then we get into how these volumetric measurements want to be measured differently. A scant teaspoon is not the same as a rounded teaspoon is not the same as a a heaping teaspoon but we've already gone over that three teaspoons makes a tablespoon however three heaping teaspoons does not make a heaping tablespoon and it also depends on material that you're using a heaping tablespoon of peanut butter can probably have double the volume of peanut butter on it just because of its viscous nature but a heaping tablespoon of salt a lot of that is going to fall off. It's going to trickle down. Then you're probably left with an extra maybe half a teaspoon of salt. Look, obviously my bias is strongly in favor of weighing ingredients and using metric rather than standard. I don't want that to affect you though. It's way more important to me that you pick something that you like and you use it consistently, know why you're using it and why it works. After all, measuring is meant to produce consistent results and consistent results paired with your own palate will yield you hopefully what you enjoy so if we're not enjoying it i mean what's the point sort of the opposite of flour are butter and brown sugar now butter usually comes at least in the u.s here in this quarter cup package with tablespoons marked out on it, that's very helpful. But if you don't have that, both of those ingredients want you to pack them tightly into the measuring cup. If you haven't seen the video yet where I make brown sugar, I'm gonna put that right up here. I demonstrate exactly why that's necessary. And then last week I did measuring weight, sort of the sister video to this one, and make sure you don't miss out on that. I'll put it right here. Mm -hmm. 